Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Tonight, I want to talk about the rulers of the darkness of this world. And it's something that's been on my mind for a while because <clears throat> the very thing that we treasure or prize the most is the thing that gets us in the most trouble. And that's our minds. We think we know, we think we understand, we think we have a grasp on things. But quite honestly, that is one of the areas that the enemy attacks us. And when you see things that are going on in society, things that are going on in the world that are, um, that are so bad, sometimes it trips us up in our minds because we can't understand why God would allow things like this to happen. So if you go with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6 and verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, he, he uses some words here. I, I just want to cover some of them. But the first is the fact that he said against uh, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, this is important because in the Bible, there's a couple of expressions that are used. One is the earth and another is the world. And the earth is talking about the planet that we live on, but the world is talking about humanity. The scripture says that God has had prophets since the world began. He wasn't talking about since he made the earth itself, but since man has been on the earth, God has had prophets. Who was the first prophet then? Adam. Adam. Who do you think taught Eve? Who do you think taught Cain and Abel how to sacrifice and what to offer to God? That, was, that came from Adam. The Bible talks about how God spoke with Adam in the garden in the cool of the evening. But it doesn't say that he gave Eve instructions because he already had somebody here to do that. And the world is pushing farther and farther away from the way that God does things. God has always had someone to represent him Amen. to humanity. But today, people are really getting into this God deals with me business. You know, the Lord told me, the Lord, I sit at home, I don't, I don't believe in organized religion. Uh, I, I, but I do have a spiritual life. I sit and I talk and I pray with God and, and I, he answers me. That's deception because that, you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Right. When the apostles was in Jerusalem, God wasn't telling the people what to do. He was telling the apostles and they told the people right. what God expected. Amen. And thank God he's got it set up the way he does today. Because in the Old Testament, if you needed to get to God, you went to the priest. And if God wanted to get to you, he sent a prophet. It was a two different offices. But today, if we need to get to God, we can boldly come to the throne of grace. We can come to God, but that doesn't mean God's going to let you sit at home and he's going to teach you what you need to know. It's not like that. Amen. Matter of fact, in the book of Jeremiah, let's just say it again. I would feel negligent if I didn't put you in remembrance of this scripture. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3 and verse 5, where he says, I will give you pastors after my heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. 
But the devil will tell you, you can sit at home and get knowledge and understanding that contradicts the word of God. Yes, so, the earth was not made in darkness, but the earth fell into darkness. In the book of Genesis chapter number one, and saints at any time, if you've got any questions, feel free to stop me. I'll, I'll answer. In Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Because I just got through saying that the earth fell into darkness. But here it makes it look like the earth was made in darkness until God said, let there be light. But that's not what happened. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2 is out of order. It's out of sequence. And this is one of the ways that God has the Bible written. Here a little and there a little. And if you don't know how to, as the scripture says, rightly divide the word of truth. Now, you, you know what that means? That there's a way to wrongly divide the word. And so if you don't know the scriptures, if you haven't been taught the scriptures, you don't know how to rightly divide the word of God. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul did when the Lord smote him, knocked him down. The Bible says, I think it's in the book of Galatians, that he spent three years in the desert of Arabia where there the Lord taught him. And as soon as he left the desert of Arabia, he went straight out on the evangelistic field. No, that's not what he did. He went to Jerusalem... And there he conferred with the other apostles. Was it because he felt like the Lord hadn't dealt with him or hadn't taught him for three years? But you know what you can do as a human being? You can make a mistake. So Paul went to the other apostles that had been with Jesus for three years. And he compared notes with them to make sure what he got was what they got. That's why it's dangerous to be off all by yourself and don't have nobody else to talk to. It's just me, the Lord, and God's people. That's dangerous. Everybody needs somebody to talk to. Because when you talk to the Lord, guess who's talking to you? The devil. I know we get excited when we're praying. Speaking in tongues and anointed when we're praying. But that doesn't mean the devil's not going to talk to you. So how do we make sure we're straight? People will come, they, they tell me, you know, I feel like the Lord has been dealing with me about this. And I'll listen. And you know what I'm gauging it by? The word of God. Because I'm going to tell you something that God never does. Never, ever, ever does. He never contradicts his word. Amen. He won't do it. And so if you got a revelation from God that it's okay for you to tell lies, that's not God. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes it's the devil. But if it contradicts the word of God, it is never from God. He doesn't do that. Let me let me just let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I just had someone uh my wife and I were we were driving out of town and we were talking about one of the churches that we know of and every year in the winter time they close down and they don't open back up until the spring. And she said, how can they do that? And I said, because they don't have nothing anyway. 
Church is just like a social club for them. It's not helping them to be holy. And is being holy important? Oh, y'all saying that. How do you know that? Because the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So how do you help per people perfect holiness when they don't even go to church? Right. Amen. I said, because they don't have nothing. They don't even have the Holy Ghost. Amen. So that's how they can shut down in the fall and open back up in the spring. Because they're not, they're not teaching their people anything anyway. Right. They come in and tell stories that make them feel good. Right. And, Make them feel like they're close to Jesus and then they go on home and do the dirt that they want to do anyway. I'm, I'm, see, I'm fussing. Well, let, me, let me just stop. Let me tell you something that the devil would... Well, first of all, let me just finish explaining this. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of, the Lord, or the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, that verse takes place when Satan fell from heaven. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 4. I'll prove it to you. I can hear skeptical amens. So I'll, I'll prove it. Let's see. Jeremiah chapter 4. Isaiah. I heard a pastor say this one time. Folks say they'll sit at home and I can sit at home and read my Bible. He said, I could better understand it if they did, but they're sitting at home watching TV. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 4, verse number 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly I beheld and there was no man and all the birds of heaven were fled now stop well I beheld and lo the fruitful place was a wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger now just stop right there here's the thing where what did he see he saw the earth when, when it was without form and void isn't that what he says in Genesis chapter 1 saw the earth when it was out form and void and there was no light so the earth was in darkness when is the animals when are the birds called out of the waters in the fifth day of creation when does God tell the, the earth to bring forth its fruit <laughs> third <laughs> Well, what did he do in the fourth day? The Sun, the moon, and the stars. All right. All right. You passed. I failed first. <laughs> <laughs> so, in his description of seeing the earth when it was without form and void, there were fields and there were birds. So we know that this can't be a time before God said let the waters bring forth abundantly or it can't be before the third day because on the third day God brought forth the grain, the trees the fields corn, well see he didn't make corn God didn't, God didn't do that man made corn through genetic manipulation over several centuries it was a grass with seeds on it and they have slowly manipulated it I believe it was the Mayans that started modifying it and yes sir I'm not understanding your question Ephesians chapter 6 no 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 I see I understand where you're coming from now yeah no I'm saying that that scripture that verse Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 is out of sequence yeah it goes between the fifth and the sixth day it, I think it's in the book of Luke chapter 7 yeah yes Luke 10 and 18 
Look at these preachers showing off tonight. My goodness. Luke 10 and 18, Jesus said, and it said, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now this is Jesus talking. Well, that fall caused great damage to the earth. But God doesn't make imperfect things. When he... When it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, I guess maybe I should explain at least this much. Yeah. Genesis chapter 1 is God's creation. Amen. To create something is to have a plan or an idea. So if you're going to build a house, you have to have blueprints to work from. So Genesis chapter 1 is God's blueprint. He hasn't actually done anything at this point. Because what does he do on the seventh day? He rests from all of his works, right? When did God take a break? I, I can guarantee you if God took a break, if he took a day off, what do you think Satan would have done to his creation? I tell you when you'll find out what he would do during the tribulation period. He's going to tear it up. So, if you look at Genesis chapter uh, 2 and verse number 1. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day... God ended his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all which from all his work which he made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which he or which God created and made. So to create is to have the plan. Before God did anything he had a plan his plan his knowledge is so perfect that he knew that when he made all of this to get what he wanted in return was going to require him having to come here himself in a body and die he knew it was going to take that that's why the bible says that he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, he already knew what it was going to take to get it accomplished. We have to do it through trial and error. If you look at a set of blueprints, you get, you get a certain period of time before them prints are no longer uh, usable. And it's not because you can't read them anymore, it's because code changes. Things happen. And, and, and so you got so many years to use those blueprints or you can't use them. You have to get a new set of prints. You know why? Because man is constantly tweaking and changing things. God didn't have to do that. Once he came up with his plan, it was so perfect, nothing could stop it. And God is so sure that he said, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, he calls those things that be not as though they are. God can speak about something having happened and it hasn't yet. You know why? Because nothing nobody or anything can do to stop God from accomplishing what he's going to accomplish. He doesn't have to talk about like, well, now tomorrow what I would like to do. He can say tomorrow and tell you what's already done. And it will happen exactly the way he said. Yes, sir. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, we're talking about God's blueprint, his plan on what he wants to do. In Genesis chapter 2, it talks about how he rested from what he created and made. But he hasn't rested yet. He's speaking as though he did. But he hasn't. Because he can call things that have not happened yet. The Bible says that he declared the end from the, the beginning. Saying that my counsel shall stand. And I will do my pleasure. Nothing can stop God from doing what he wants to do. So he can speak and say, on the seventh day I rested. Even though he hasn't even done it yet. 
because you're not going to stop him from resting on the seventh day. How do we know God is still working? Because the moment you get the Holy Ghost, he's working on you. What do you think the Holy Ghost does for us? Now, and I'll get to this later on, but let me just say this right now. God's not going to give you the Holy Ghost and then fix you. He doesn't do that. He's working in you to help you fix yourself. Those things that I used to do and I don't do it anymore. You know, we sing that song, those places I used to go, I don't go no more. Those things I used to say, I don't say no more. Why? It's not because God handcuffed you and gagged you. It's because he gave you the Holy Ghost, which is the power to help you control yourself. That's why people can have the Holy Ghost and still go sin. Because they're not allowing the power that God gave them to help them in their life. He's not going to do it for us. But he's working in us. You know, uh, another song we sang, they don't sing like, we don't sing like we used to. Something on the inside. Working on the outside. What a mighty change in my life. You know why? Because God gave me something on the inside that can help me work on what I'm doing. I don't have to go off and cuss somebody out now. Now, does that mean I walk away smiling and happy? No. My feelings might be hurt. There's been times I've walked away so angry I'm ready to cry, but I never let them know. One time my boss, he was trying his best to provoke me. And he just kept on saying stuff. And he said, go on and say something. I said, no. He said, oh, I know you want to say it. I can see it all over your face. <laughs> He's just pushing me. I can see it all over your face. I know you want to say something. Go on and say it. I said, I don't have anything to say to you. Amen. You think I was happy sitting there? I wanted to get up and choke him. I did. He was pushing. Was that me? Oh, no. It was the power of the Holy Ghost that helped me control me. The whole time I'm sitting there, get yourself together. Get yourself together. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm talking to me. Don't do it. Don't do it. You, you, you got this. You don't have to open your mouth. You got this. You got this. And I'm bringing my hands down. <laughs> Amen. It's not because God forced me to sit there and keep my mouth shut. It wasn't that. But he was there reminding me, you can do this. Yes. And let me just tell you, I was mad. When I left up out of his office, I was mad. And I was mad all day. Went home, told my wife, mad all evening. <laughs> I was upset about that. If I did anything wrong, it was I let the sun go down on my wrath. I was still mad. Got up the next day, not even wanting to go into work because I was still mad at him. I got myself together, though. The Lord helped me. Amen. Amen. So in Jeremiah, he tells us when the earth, at what time period the earth was without form and void. He says something here, though, in Jeremiah. He says, and there was no man. Right. He didn't say like he did with the birds, and the birds fled from the heavens. He didn't say, and man fled from the earth. There was no man. So when this took place, it was at a time before man was made. And what day was that? The sixth day, God created man. Now, if it was before man, but after there were birds, when were the bird? When did the birds come around? Third day. Now that's Third day. fifth day. Uh, it's, it's, uh, wait a second. <laughs> Finally, well, let's see. 
The fifth day, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. So on the fifth day, we have birds. And he says here that the birds had fled from the heavens. So they were already made, but there was no man. So somewhere after the fifth day, but before the sixth day, the earth was without form and void. Yes, ma'am. God created animals twice. Her question is, did God create animals twice? Yep. First time he brought them forth out of the water. The second time he brought them forth from the dust of the earth, from the ground. Which is where he brought us from. Don't let that fool you, though. Because folks like to think that since we share DNA with animals, that somehow we're related to them. I'm not related to no animal. <laughs> I was just looking at something last night. And when our ancestors were still uh, swinging in trees, I'm like, maybe your ancestors were swinging in trees. But mine wasn't. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. And when the Bible says, and God said, let there be light, it wasn't because there was darkness. The word light here, it was translated light, but it literally means life. L-I-F-E. And God said, let there be life. Meaning, meaning those that subscribe to the notion of the Big Bang and it was a, a rock, the planet was a rock, and somehow meteors kept bombarding the planet and bringing water until we have oceans, and then lightning kept striking mud until it became enzymes or something and sparked life and then from there you see the mess that man is making all because he don't want to believe what God said God just did it and how how did he how did he make the world well that's what you say how do you know by faith we understand that the worlds were created by the word of God. God said it and it just happened. You know what? Man is limited in his understanding. We can't have something without having something first. We can make a lot of things, but we have to have something first to make it from. So man can take elements, molecules, and put them together and make something from that. But he had to have something to start with in the first place. God didn't. If he did, he wouldn't be God. Now, isn't that just ignorant? Isn't that just silly, foolish of us to believe that? Yeah, because God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Got a whole lot of folks paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a degree to learn it wrong. They can just come here. We'll teach them for free. <laughs> yes, sir. When the Bible uses worlds, plural, he's talking about planets. Yeah. And there are, there are billions of planets. I was just telling I was just telling someone the other day I was like God is so incomprehensible the human body is a world in itself we've got all kind of bacteria that we need billions of bacteria in us in our stomachs uh, in our appendix I mean there's we have all kind of things, microorganisms that live inside of us, on our skin. Things that we need to have, but they're so small that we can't even see it. It's a world. It's like our whole body is a world all by itself. Amen. If you could shrink yourself down to the size of a virus, our body is teeming with life. Come back up a little bit bigger. This whole planet Earth is teeming with life. It's got all kinds. 
they, I forget how many, I, I was reading, uh, doing some research on something, and I saw where they were talking about uh, how many millions of different life forms man has identified. And they estimate, it was, now just, just hear me out, because I'm going to give the numbers wrong, but I, want you to under, I just want you to see the scale of what they were talking about. They said, right now we have two million life forms identified, and we suspect there's another five that we haven't even identified yet. That's insects. It was just, it was crazy. All of that God made simply to keep this planet and its inhabitants all in balance. But then you look at the galaxy that we're in, and it's got billions with a B, stars in it. And each one of those stars have planets and moons that are revolving around them. That's just in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. But to get to the nearest planet would take so many light years that they would have to build what they call sentry ships because it would take hundreds of years People would have to live their entire lives, generation after generation, just to get to the next nearest planet. It is that large. Space is so big that we can't see the end of it. The Hubble, uh, the, the James Webb Telescope, man, it can see some stuff. And then, you know one thing that they've discovered? That they still can't see the end of the universe. They still can't see the edge of it. In any direction that they point, they can't see it. And God is bigger than that. Amen. His throne is above the third heavens. I mean, I mean, and then we sit back and act arrogant and act like we know something. Oh, we don't know anything. Sometimes... Sometimes we think we really know how to bring a challenge to God. Maybe if I could get him to see it my way. The way you see things is so wrong. Even when you're right, you're so wrong. And we think we can talk to God as if he's one of us. I, 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 you all have heard me say, I was listening to these young people, they had some kind of uh, young people convention going on. I don't even. I'm sure these people didn't have the Holy Ghost, but they were doing this youth thing. And uh, he said, "We're going to ask Pastor so and so. He's the youth pastor. We're going to have him come up and pray." And he gets up there and he stands in front of everybody. Hey, God! It's like how what how kind of nerve is that to talk to the Creator that made everything? And has made it so complicated we can't even begin to come close to duplicate what God has done. We think that, we, you know, we're talking about artificial intelligence and robots and all that. We can't make a creature as smart as a gnat. Literally, we can't come up with something smart as smart and adaptive as a gnat. And a gnat so small, sometimes you have to do this to try to figure out if you're really seeing something. And then we, got, then we act like we can talk to God as if he's one of us, like he's one of the boys, you know, in the neighborhood. Hey, God. No. No, I'm afraid that there are some people who approach God in a very disrespectful way. They're going to be the ones that he's going to force to kneel. You wouldn't give me my respect when you were alive, but I'll tell you what you're going to do now. You're going to confess. And you are going to bow. I'd rather bow than to be made to stoop. I'd rather get down voluntarily and praise God and worship him of my own free will than to have God make me do it. Hey Amen. Y'all get me started preaching. All of this that God made, and it was in his mind to have man rule over the works of his hands. Look in the book of Psalm, chapter number 8. We are a very strange creature. Psalm 8, number 8. Now this is in the first division of Psalms. 
Psalm number eight. I was trying to impress y'all. Nobody. And verse number three. When I consider thy heavens. And just stop. I don't think we do enough of that. That's why we think we're so important. Because we don't stop and consider what God has actually made. The heavens are so vast we can't even reach the next, uh, the next sun. We can't, man can't even reach it. But we don't stop and consider. I think the astronomers, I think they do a good job of considering the vastness of heaven. I wish God's people would spend more time considering what it is that God actually did. Everything is so precise and so in balance. Amen. Let me, just, let me just. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers. Who's doing this? God. He, he made it, right? When I consider thy heavens, the thy here is God. And the work of thy fingers, that's God's fingers. The moon and the stars, which thou, that's God, the thou. Hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? See, we think we're important. We think we're somebody. The psalmist said, When I consider what you have done and then compare man to that, why are you fooling around with man? I had a backslider tell me this one time. He said, I don't believe in God. But if there was a God, and he's as great as y'all say he, say he is, why in the world would he be fooling around with somebody as silly as man? Well, he got part of it right. <laughs> At least he had enough sense to consider that if God is as great as we say he is, then we can be like the psalmist. Well, what is it about man? That you keep on being mindful of us. How many times did Lucifer mess up before God put him out for good? One time. How about the third of the angels? How many times did they mess up and God kick them out permanently? One time. And how many times did somebody fall into sin after they get the Holy Ghost? Seven. <laughs> I'm not trying to make it look like we go out and we're living in sin. I'm not trying to say that at all. But the day you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost is the cleanest you'll ever be in the sight of God. The day you receive the Holy Ghost, the joy, the excitement, all of that, that is as good as it's going to get. And after that, when you walk out the church doors, you know what you're going to do? You're going to meet the devil right out there and he's going to start right away trying to pick at what you got. He'll tarnish. If you let him, he'll tarnish your joy. If you allow him to, he'll make you feel like God is not fair to you. Let me tell you something that the devil loves to do. He wants to get God's people off by their self. He knows their strength in numbers. He knows that as long as we stay together, that nothing can be stopped by what we want to do. So what does he do? He waits to catch the straggler that's off by their self, and he starts talking to them. See how excited everybody else is when they go to church? But look at you. You all, all by yourself. They don't care. Uh, did you see the way that Brother Wicker looked at your shoes when you came in? I saw... He had a smirk on his face. That's what the devil will do. I remember one time I thought I had backslid. I was in church Sunday and I went to school and I was cussing and doing some bad stuff. I'm like 15 years old. That Saturday, I came to the church and told Elder Scott, I said, I want to come back to the Lord. He said, what? <laughs> I said, I want to come back to the Lord. He said, when did you leave? 
I said, well, this week? He said, no, you didn't. He said, what did you do? I, said, I told him what I did. He said, well, you didn't backslide, but you are silenced. <laughs> You're down for 30 days. I said, okay. I, just, I was so glad to be back. The devil, when I walked in to tell him there was some kind of potluck going on, I thought, they all know what I did. See, the devil, he messes with your head. Ah, they are looking at you funny. So then what do we do? Well, we go from the front row to the middle. But then we know that the folks behind us is looking at the back of our head funny. The devil will tell you. So, you know, well, I got let me just let me just ease on in late. I'll sit back here in the back. Now, you know who knows what you're doing? You and the devil. And the pastor, too. He's seeing what you're doing. I know, folks, I, I, I have yet to call it wrong. I know when people are burdened down and stressed out about something, and I know when somebody's getting ready to walk out of the church. I know. And I'll talk with them and talk with them. Come on now, you can get yourself together. You, you can do better. There's no point in letting the devil trick you. And you can tell when you're talking to them whether they're receiving what you're saying or not. And a lot of times it's not because they've already been convinced. Oh, oh all right. Uh, he said in... in Psalm 8 for thou hast made him and this is verse 5 for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor thou madest him to have dominion over the work of thy hands God made us to have the dominion over the work of his hands and we blew it not us as individuals Adam blew it now I heard a preacher say this one time, and, and I, I, a pastor actually say this, and I don't agree at all. He said when Adam named the animals, Adam was able to, um, to breathe underwater. He was able to fly. Because how could he name all the animals if he couldn't go up underneath the water and see all of them? And he, he had to be able to fly because how could he get up to where the birds were? I said, now... <laughs> When I heard him say it, I wanted to snicker. But see, unlike unlike some folks, I, I, <laughs> I thought, now that's crazy. Adam could fly, and he could live underwater if he wanted to. That's foolishness. It don't say that anywhere in the Bible. Matter of fact, I'll tell you what it does say. And the Lord brought all the animals before Adam to see what he would call them. That's, that's what the scripture says. Adam didn't go flying up in the air. To, to, well, now that looks like a stork. <laughs> Just silly. God made man with it in his mind for man to have dominion over the works of his hands. Well, we have partial dominion. That's how come we can have bacon and burgers because we can cage up a cow. We can cage up chickens and pigs. We can make the ground. We can bend it to our will. But we don't have dominion over God's, over God's work yet. Because if you don't believe it, just go someplace where they've got lions and they're hungry. And see if you can and take dominion over one of them. I saw a man yesterday online fist fighting with a kangaroo. And they'll tell people, stay away from them kangaroos. They will hurt you. They'll hospitalize you or kill you. Leave them animals alone. He <laughs> Hallelujah. 
The devil has convinced people that they are fighting against other people. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, he said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But the devil will tell you that your boss is hateful and mean and you need to do something to him. He'll tell him that your cousin is a nasty character and you need to go tell him, get him in trouble. The devil will tell you stuff like that because he's got you convinced that you're fighting against flesh and blood. But it's not. You're fighting against those that are weak-minded who allow the devil to persuade them to do things. They don't know. The only one that you could truly say has got a problem is the person that's been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives evidence. Not because somebody whispered in their ears and say this. Not that. The, the Holy Ghost. And they go and act hateful. Because you can't get sweet water and bitter water from the same well. They are a peculiar creature. When you have the God of the creation, the Bible says God is love, but you hate folks. You're, you're a unique creature when you can do that. When you feel with the Holy Ghost, but you can hate people. Well, the Bible, let me tell you something that Jesus said. Love your enemies. Bless them. That curse you. That's hard, ain't it? See, most of us don't even have enemies. Most of us don't. We got folks that make us mad. We got people that get on our nerves. But just because somebody chews gum in a way that makes you upset, that don't make them your enemy. Now, we got some folks that just need to have a testimony they just got to y'all pray for me I'm going through something on my job well what are you going through well you know the co-workers they sneak off and take breaks when they're not supposed to that's not you're not being persecuted <laughs> that's not your enemy y'all think I'm making stuff up I'm telling you people oh they get excited about it Whoo, I'm struggling no you not Better get on to work and go on work. <laughs> I've, had, I've had people attack me at work. And not because I was saved. I've been attacked. I've had my life threatened because I worked hard. One man got so mad at me, he said, you messing up everything. I said, man, I'm just doing my job. He said, slow down. I said, I am going slow. He said, go slow. I'm like, what is your problem? He said, well, you know, uh, we're, we're only supposed to get a certain amount done in an hour. you going above that. Now, you know what that means? They're going to make all of us start doing that. I said, well, I can't help it. I'm not going to steal from these people. They, they told me to work, and I'm going to work. Oh, I, I, he was mad. And one guy come up and tell me, I know that you go to church. But if you do thus and so, I'm going to feel like it's a personal attack on me and my family. And I don't have a problem killing anybody that does that. I said, I should have said, do you know who you're talking to? I'm a child of the king. Don't... <laughs> Don't make God come down. And... I said, well, I don't believe in that anyway. He said, all right, I just wanted to warn you because I like you and I don't want to hurt you. Sometimes we have to face stuff like that. But he wasn't persecuting me because I was saved. He was mad because I wanted to work. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Support my family. That's all I was trying to do. Thank the Lord he moved me on somewhere else. Amen. Amen. He says that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood 
and the word wrestle here means to struggle. You're not struggling against people. You're struggling against spirits. And any time you struggle against spirits and you ain't getting the victory, after a while, if you're still not getting the victory, you know why? It ain't because of them. Well, let me close my eyes and say this. When my ways please the Lord, he'll make even my enemies to be at peace with me. Isn't that what the scripture says? All right. I just didn't want to make sure that we walked out of here and somebody be, Pastor, now I heard what you said, but on my job, they're doing this. I'm not talking about on your job. I'm talking about somebody that wants to be your enemy. Hey Amen. There's some folks that'll get mad at you because of where you go to church. Got family members that'll be mad at you. Why are you going to that church? Why are you going over there with them people? Oh yeah, they get really nasty and ugly about it. And it's like, why are you worried about where I'm going to church? You know why? Because there's something different. Any time, see, if, if, we, if we just drop down and said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when somebody makes me mad, I'll cuss them out. Then I'll go home and I'll drink. And then Sunday I'll come to church and lift up my hands and worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, and when I go back, the man that made me mad, I'll tell him, you know what, I'll forgive you. Because God told me to. I'm forgiving you for what you did. But don't forget that you did it. Because, but let me, and then if you got something to say, well, Jesus loves you. See, that's the way the world does things. They'll do that kind of stuff, and they're okay with God. That's what they think. Well, you know, everybody messes up. Nobody's perfect. When people start talking like that, it's because they don't want to live right. Nobody's perfect. And yet Jesus said, be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, if Jesus said, be perfect, why would he tell you to do something he knows you can't do? And by perfect, he doesn't mean flawless. He means mature. Be mature. Because somebody that gets the Holy Ghost today is not going to behave themselves as well as someone that's had it for 10 years. Amen. But shame on the person that's had the Holy Ghost for 10 years and you still acting like a one-year-old. There's something wrong with that. Amen. You should be growing in the grace of the Lord. You should be growing in the knowledge Amen. of the Lord. When you first get the Holy Ghost, Peter said, desire the sincere milk of the word. You should desire the sincere milk of the word. But as you grow, you should start being able to eat more than just milk. So when you first get the Holy Ghost, it may be a struggle for you to forgive somebody that molested you. Amen, anybody? Oh, that's a struggle. But after you've been saved for years... And you're still walking around with a grudge? Right. Something ain't right. You're not growing like you should. At some point, those things that I got called out of Amen. and the people that have wronged me and hurt me, I should be able to forgive them. Amen. Amen. Some folks like to hang on stuff to stuff because it just feels good. Right. They're so used to it right. that it just feels good and I like it. I like the way it makes me feel. I like feeling mad. I've, I've been around people like that, always mad about something. It's like, my goodness, I couldn't stand being you. I couldn't. I don't want to be mad all the time. I don't want to be mad at all. And mad when somebody makes me mad. So there. But you know, I don't understand people who like that. They gravitate around stuff like that. Negativity, always upset and angry about something. Every time you talk to them, mm -hmm, and you know what else? It's like, man, guess what I heard? What? They're giving us a raise at work. How much? They're giving us a dollar an hour. Is that all? It's like you got to be mad about something. I'll take it. Yes, sir. Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> yeah, that's the way it is. There are just some people who are always upset about stuff and they do it for so long that it becomes natural to them they don't know how to behave any other way now let them come and get the Holy Ghost it's going to take them some time to get up out of that amen that's why we don't have any business going around beating up on folks you see so and so the way they asked, did you see the way they was looking I'm going to come up in the church looking all crazy really Mm, shame on them and they just got the Holy Ghost too two days ago you think they'd be coming in here acting. it's like they just got the Holy Ghost leave them alone why are you mad be thanking God at least to come in the church oh that's like being mad at somebody for being at the hospital oh here they come can you imagine if you walked in the doctor oh what's wrong with you we would be upset over that, wouldn't we? I'm sick. That's what's wrong. That's why I come here. But people come to church and we mad. Oh, look at them. Shouldn't be like that. How does anyone ever learn how to love and serve God if we constantly beating them up when they get here? Oh, I'm trying to be good. The devil wants you to believe that what God says is not true. He's done that from the very beginning. How did he get Eve to fall? You shall not surely die. And yet God already said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And the devil comes along and says, no, you won't. What made her believe the serpent over the Lord? Why take his word? Because she didn't just take his word. He said, but God knows in the day you eat thereof, you shall be as gods. What's he saying? God's holding you down. If he loves you so much, why hasn't he offered you this godhood like I'm offering it to you? If you notice, he didn't tempt Eve to stab her husband, beat him with a stick. He didn't tempt her to do any of that stuff, did he? Go kick your husband. He didn't tempt her to do that. He told her, just disobey God. If he can get you to disobey God, everything else goes down easy. And listen, sometimes we, we got this idea, and, and I'm going to be finished. Sometimes we got this idea that, well, at least they're partly right. Well, you know, in their church, they believe in getting the Holy Ghost. Now, they don't baptize right, but at least they're partly right. Let me tell you what partly right will do for you. God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, knowing good and evil. Right? Isn't that what the devil said would happen? He said, You will become as God's knowing good and evil. And isn't that what happened? It was the thou shalt not surely die part that he lied about. So being partly right cost them everything. Amen. Where is Adam and Eve right now? Dead as they want to be. I'm sure their bones aren't even bones anymore. Why? Because they was partly right. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that people are almost okay with God. Because when he comes back, he's not looking for folks that's almost right. When God comes to get his church, he's not coming back for people who are trying to get it together. That's not going to get you into heaven. You know, they used to say that all the time. 
I'm not where I should be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And you're going to go right to the lake with that mindset. That ain't going to work with God. Well, I noticed that you're still smoking cigarettes, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Do you think God's going to buy that? Not when he gives you the Holy Ghost and says, but now here, I need you to be holy. Because I'm coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Wait now, that's the part that's going to get a whole lot of folks messed up. Or any such thing. It's the such things that's going to mess people up. I don't smoke cigarettes and you vaping. That's a such thing. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm talking about? I drink a little, but I don't get drunk. Don't drink at all. Hey Amen. I know I'm messing with, with, with folks filled with the Holy Ghost now. Because saved folks now, people filled with the Holy Ghost is drinking. No, they ain't saved. I'm saying it, and it's being broadcast. If you're drinking, you ain't saved. I got plenty of scriptures to say that you're not saved. Show me one scripture that says it's okay for you to drink. And please don't come with the uh, drink a little wine for thy stomach. Say, please don't bring me that. Because all I'm going to tell you to do is get the first part of it. Drink, no longer drink water. If you're still drinking water, you're, de you're disobeying the Bible. So obviously that ain't what he was talking about. Amen. You drinking, cussing, smoking, fornicating. Living in adultery, hating, being argumentative and fighting. You're not going to heaven like that. Amen. 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 All right. Y'all know. Uh, every now and then I, I get fussy. Yes, yes ma'am. She said Adam and Eve were going to make the rapture right because they repented well, if they don't, something is seriously wrong because they lived what they knew in their day. After they fell into sin, their rule was to offer sacrifice. And that's who taught their children to do it. So Adam and Eve had to do right. Plus, the Bible says that Adam was a type of Christ. So if Adam can't be right, that means Christ ain't right. So Adam had to have gotten himself together. Amen. I can't speak too much about Sister Eve, but... <laughs> But listen, you bring up an interesting point, which is this. A lot of times people try to trap us with, so are you trying to say that my mama's going to hell because she don't believe like you believe? Well, I'm not talking to your mama. I'm talking to you. And the Bible says, choose you this day who you will serve. A lot of times we get all hung up. Well, what about the Indians that was here long before there was any uh, people coming here bringing the gospel? What about them? That's not my business. And it ain't none of your business. Your business is you. They want to trap you and in, get into these protracted arguments that don't mean anything to anybody. All right, let's say you get everything worked out for the Indians. What does that do for you? We have to be careful. People try to trap us into foolishness. We living in a time where if you want to make it to heaven, you better be filled with the spirit and the, Jesus said you must be born of the water and the spirit he didn't say part of it or half of it and that's that's just to get you there get you a ticket that don't even mean you're going to make it just because you got the Holy Ghost don't mean you're going to heaven it doesn't you, you better be living holy amen any other questions anything else you want me to fuss about no, stand on your feet.